I'm assuming he's like a radio DJ. He's like a 40 year old teenager. Like, all right, let's get squiggy and wiggy here with uh, Boris Karloff. You know, whatever. (laughs) Motherfucking goddamn orange peel beef. It's one fucking hour time. Of course, this is the show where we talk about one movie for one fucking hour. I'm Evan Husney, and we got with us here tonight, as always, we got Big T, Tom Fitzgerald. Tom, what's going on? Hi. It's one fucking time here. What's up? <laughs> ah, there he is. Yeah. Yeah, brother. And we also got <laughs> to my right, uh, we got Mr. Marcus Herring. What's going on, Marcus? What's up, guys? Super stoked. I love this era that we're diving into right now, so I'm just uh, really excited for tonight. That's right. And uh, if you've been living under a rock, we've been doing this cool thing where we are launching these polls on our Instagram uh, social media channel right now where you get to vote on the movies that we're covering on the show. So uh, tonight, we're doing one fucking hour on Targets from 1968. That's the film you guys picked from 1968. It was a very close race. It won mm. by a single vote. So we might have been Jeez. doing Rosemary's Baby tonight, but that's why you got to vote. But instead, we're doing Targets, that's which right. I'm pretty... Every st- vote counts. It does. It does. So I'm actually pretty <laughs> stoked about that. And uh, stay tuned to the end of uh, tonight's broadcast because we're going to talk about the four movies from 1969 that we're going to throw up uh, on a poll oh that you guys will God. vote for. But <clears throat> we should say... So last week for episode 67, we picked, you know, obviously you guys voted on a movie from 1967. That was point blank. And now we're doing targets for 1968. So we're we're right in the middle of these two movies, you know, Tom, that are right on the. Well, I mean, this year, these years in film, 1967, 1968, you could say they're uh, they're on the cusp. Well, exactly. So, uh, really, you've got uh, okay. How about let's put it this way: culturally, things don't stop, you know, on December thirty first, nineteen fifty nine, and start on January first, nineteen sixty. Right. You know, there's a lot of float, and um, significant things happen usually, um, uh, and, t- and and epochs change, and you know, cultural tides shift. You know, and often, uh, you know, in the middle, beginning, or end of a, of a decade, and this was happening. Uh, in the 60s for right here 67 to 68 69 and, and 70 and then by 1971 let's say everything was completely different for so hollywood this is the for cusp. Film. these movies are on it's the cusp. They, are, they are on the cusp you know for many different reasons and last week was a real cusp uh title <laughs> yeah. because um yeah. it had one foot in conventional kind of detective movie, you know, right. that dad's half asleep watching to like crazy progressive strangeness that was very influenced by European cinema yeah. uh, and was more personal and conflicted and uh, confusing. And, um, you know, uh, and, and, and tonight is no different in its own way. It's a cusper. Yeah. And, uh, and to the point, what I'm saying is by 1969 and specifically Easy Rider, uh you know and and like woodstock as a documentary being a huge huge hit both right um it's done there ain't no cusp and what and just to explain <laughs> cusps are like there's one day between astrology signs where where some people who are born on the cusp are like i'm kind of still a pisces but i'm kind of <laughs> getting aries you know so that's the point of this right, so right. by the time for next week we, by the time we get to next week we're going to be like fully Taurus or whatever you know right we're getting right into 69 things are changing but this tonight and last week's we were on deck cusp um and so we're gonna be uh we're gonna be cusping pretty hard with everybody tonight riding the cusp (laughs) riding that cusp but um before we do that before we get to the hour I just want to take a second here to do a little bit of business um for those of you who don't know we've recently launched the official one fucking hour patreon patreon.com slash one fucking hour uh, and that is the only place that you'll be able to get uh feature length audio commentary tracks recorded by us so you can hang out with us as we watch movies together 
go to town, you know, kind of break the one fucking hour mold and we get to go as long as the movies are and talk about them and dissect them and, you know, get into all the weird, absurdist observations that we all have about these movies. We did Texas Chainsaw Massacre as our very first audio commentary track. And now we've recently released, pretty excited about this, OG Star Wars from 1977. The three of us watched yeah. through that. So if you want to watch Star right. Wars with your homies here, yeah. the only way hey, maybe you've that. never seen Star Wars. Yeah. And it'd be it'd be a fun way to see it for the first it time would. with it these would. three knuckleheads. Exactly. So, uh, yeah. so if you want to watch uh, watch along with us, Star Wars 77. Definitely get on patreon.com slash one fucking hour and you get early access to all of the episodes that we do 24 hours before everybody else. So you'll be the cool person in school for sure. So it's just five bucks a month, <laughs> five bucks a month, patreon.com slash one fucking hour. All right. Are you guys ready to cusp it out hard with uh, targets? Oh, yeah. Should we start the hour? Should we get into it? Let's hit that clock. Let's all right. It. So here comes the clock and boom. All right, just a little bit of backstory, a little background on Targets for the good folks. Also, guys, this is a this is a great pick, too, in a lot of ways, because Targets was just released on Criterion Blu-ray or whatever, 4K. So this is a very timely, you know, apropos yeah. that we're also covering this. So yeah, um, I got to check that out. So it's also our second Bogdanovich, our second bite at the Bogdanovich apple. <laughs> That's you know? right. Yeah, we did. Uh, we did Peter uh, Peter B's mask. From 1985, uh, which course. was uh, kind of on the cusp of uh, <laughs> loving it and hating it, <laughs> like, like oh, yeah. it wasn't a hate. It, it wasn't like a trashing, but no. it also wasn't like uh, a love fest. So no, anyway. but yeah, this <laughs> is but it was a, great. This is a I love of, that episode. This is a little bit of a continuation, I think, into that because we are going to talk about some of the same ideas, concepts, collaborations, and Peter B. in general. We're going to get into that. Yeah. But definitely yeah. check out Mask in the archives if you haven't seen it. It's one of my favorite episodes that we've ever done, oddly enough. Okay, now, a little bit of backstory, background on Targets. So I'm taking this right from the, from the brand new Criterion Blu-ray here. This is, the, this, is the, uh, this is the synopsis they have. Old Hollywood collides with new Hollywood and screen horror with real-life horror in the startling <coughs> date... <coughs> <laughs> in the startling Sorry. debut feature from Peter Bogdanovich. Produced by Roger Corman, this chillingly prescient vision of American-made carnage casts Boris Karloff as a version of himself, an aging horror movie icon whose fate intersects with that of a seemingly ordinary man, played by Tim O'Kelly, on a psychotic shooting spree around Los Angeles. Charged with provocative ideas about the relationship between mass media and ma mass violence, Targets gets a model of maximally effective filmmaking on a minimal budget and a potent first statement from one of the defining voices of the American New Wave. Puts Peter B. over quite a bit there, I guess. But that is uh, that is Targets. It's and, a little overstated, uh, but yeah. Yeah, I know, exactly. Um, <laughs> you gotta sell DVDs, guys. You know? Yeah, right. You gotta get some Blu-rays out there for y'all. Okay, well, let's, let's get into this. Maybe... Um, Maybe Tom, do we, do we want to just talk a little bit about the cultural context of, you know, this is this is a cusper, and this is a movie that I'm sure right. when it came out at its time was probably extraordinarily effective, and a lot of people weren't expecting it at all. Yeah, I mean, look, it's 1968. Let's talk about the year that we're covering here broadly, and uh, almost any of the other films that we had uh, put in the poll would apply somewhat. 19, I just looking at my notes, 1968, an American nightmare. And uh, none right. of us know 1968 on a personal level, but like, again, Mad Men, obligatory Mad Men reference. Like, if you watch that episode, like, you see everyone in the cast is devastated by the news of MLK's assassination right. in April 68. And I, I can't relate to it, but I'm like, wow, that, I think, really freaked America out really hard. But then incredibly... Uh, you know, and, and sort of bookends for this, you know, the, the middle of the year, mm -hmm. you had uh, RFK assassinated, who was probably going to be the next president. I mean, right. that must have shook people to their core. There was also a huge riot, uh, you know, on TV at the Democratic National Convention uh, in, in the middle in the summer. So and there's everything else that was happening. So um, uh, and there were huge riots, too. And, and you know, the city's burning down because of MLK. So uh you know if 67 was like sergeant pepper and summer of love and you know kind of the 
the, the, the cultural mind. Uh, this is the year that's black and white and dark and very Night of the Living Dead, actually. That's kind of a perfect film. But so is this one. Yeah. And, uh, of course, this film bombed and it happened. Well, you were saying that, uh, you know, um, I think the shadow of those assassinations didn't help targets. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, no, um, exactly. It, it did not get a wide release. It, it came out, you know, in August 68, the same year as those assassinations. And it became part of a rallying cry for gun control, like out of it, you know, and, mm. and not many people saw it because of the uh, the limited release. But critics, you know, it, were very impressed, you know, with the film and the concept behind it, which we'll get into. And especially the fact that he made it with such little, you know, money financing mm -hmm. um, was was Very something cheap. that did impress critics, but not a lot of people saw it when it came out on its right. original release. Well, just and just one other thing, just about the the mood. I think it's what I, you know. We were, I was tasked to kind of articulate uh, the mood. Is uh, one thing I'll never forget is Roger Ebert actually wrote a write up of Night of the Living Dead because mm -hmm. he saw it in 1968 in like a triple bill for the kids. You know, it was a kind of screening where like um, all the kids uh, were thrown there by the parents at the mall. And it was movies, you know, like, uh, you know, Mask of the Red Death or like, you yeah. know, um, you know, like, uh, you know, The Mummy you know, Returns film or something. Yeah, yeah. You know, like like light fair that that makes sense. And that's why the parents left them off. But then the programmer didn't even know probably like, oh, it's a zombie movie, you know, right. like an old 40s movie. <laughs> but it's like, no, this movie has, uh, you know, um, people's arms torn off, intestines Guts. are eaten, yeah. mothers uh, stabbed by children. Perfect. And what Ebert's testimony is um, the kids were screaming and crying and freaking out in horror. Wow. Like like earth shattering horror. So that, I think that always I always think of that with targets because that's my point is that the warm kind of soft, cute, uh, old timey, late night TV kind of Boris Karloff movie mm -hmm. style, which you see in this film. Mm -hmm. which is playing at the drive-in why this film is playing right is in contrast to hard ugly what we call now mass shootings which right. really shook people to the core because yeah. and you can set this up is um this film is, is loosely based on an event that happened it was, it was the film was shot less than a year after this incident that it inspired it yeah i mean maybe that's the right time to get into it maybe before we do just just quick just to throw okay. it to marcus get marcus in the show here uh no nah, i'm good I'm <laughs> no 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 but just like any any uh <laughs> any origin with targets or when you saw this movie reaction thoughts how you feeling on you it? you know i i was just i remember coming across this from i didn't know about it till the raging bulls easy riders raging bulls and right. then um just the idea that of how it came together just really fascinated me that like uh basically you know, um, he had someone took that, you know, uh, asked him to use pre existing footage, use it, ma and make sure he used an old film. You know, or Corman insisted, he like, gave him a film to, to, to make and said, as long as you use, yeah. you know, this Boris Karloff movie, The Terror. And then he yeah, came we'll up with that. this yeah. brilliant one. Well, I know we'll, we'll get into it, but that, just the idea that someone could take an existing piece of movie and spin it into a whole new direction yeah. just really fascinated me. Cool. And, uh, you know, and I found it to be so inspiring. Not only like the the budget, like you mentioned, is like I think they said that they did it for a hundred thousand yeah. dollars, which wow. today is like about a hundred and eight eight hundred and seventy thousand. So it's still right. under a million. Yeah, um, that's crazy. And, it's hard to make uh, it anyway. Just the sort of yeah. I found that just so inspiring that he was able to um, piece it together, and that that just fascinated me. So I had to see it after that. So. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so uh, now to circle back around just to sort of what Tom was talking about is the is the real story that, uh, you know, inspired targets. Um, and uh, this is one of the craziest things, because I think this incident here of Charles Whitman, uh, of what happened in this is in Austin, right? Austin, Texas, mm -hmm. isn't this at the university? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think this is really one of the other things that just flipped people out that, you know, the yeah, idea of somebody just pointing a gun and shooting random people was not really something that you heard about all that often. No. And, and, and this is one of the meaningless, that, uh, yeah. like, uh, he, he has no idea who he's shooting. It's yeah. just people in his, in his scope. You know? Yeah. And obviously, yeah. you know, we hear that every day now, 
But back now then, it's commonplace. This my, was my a, brother and yeah, my brother and I went to college there, and he would say that you would always on campus you would always keep an eye on like the tower, you know, right. to think to think oh. of yourself in relation to that tower, and that that stayed with me when I lived in Austin too. Whenever I was on campus, I'd always think about the tower, thinking like, am I in range here? Or yeah. you know, it's always just in your mind. That's fucked up. Well, just to give a little people, that if you're not familiar with Charles Whitman, uh, he was an altar boy. He was an Eagle Scout. He was a Marine and, of course, a mass murderer. In 1966, between the last day of July and the first day of August, he was was a 25-year-old ex-banker teller, and he killed 16 people, including his wife and mother, and wounded more than 30 others, shooting the majority of his victims from the observation desk, as as he mentioned, the tower, of the main building of the University of Austin, Texas. But the thing that really makes him um, also, uh, I guess, I guess, you know, first of its kind in many ways that he became a household name out of this. He was the mm-hmm. media sort of took him into a whole nother level uh, level of, you know, um, and I think this movie talks about, I think this movie, a main theme of it is the idea of, you know, violence in media and how that sort of bounced back and forth and things like that. Yeah. And shout out. You to see our, a gruesome headline. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was just going to say, yeah. Shout out to our movies. We hate part two. Because oh, no. I'm, I'm going to make a connection to one of our favorite films of all time. Natural Born Killers. Um, oh. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> We're Tom Sizemore in the film. Um, I caught it when I was rewatching it for that episode. He right. was talking about how like, you know, one of his parents or something was, you know, involved in that shooting. Uh, at the you know so there, there's a connection there like his parent like that character you know his right. parent died in this massacre so but of course natural born killers is supposed to be this commentary on the culture of violence in america and i think this movie is too right well natural born killers is really trying to make it happen you know they're for trying to force it trying to like, right. you know uh, every at every corner there's like, like they have people uh you know reacting to it going like i love mickey mallory they're trying to make it like a thing right 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 so hard it just looks like forced and then here it's uh yeah it's done effortlessly because Cold. yeah you don't see the aftermath of it you're not seeing right. the reaction of the press and stuff you're not seeing yeah. all that stuff so i think you know this is done much more yeah with uh, you know even this is like an exploitation film on some level it's done with a more deft hand you know right so Charles Whitman, um, I guess the other noteworthy thing, yeah, he was on the cover of Time magazine. You know, he was right. also not trying to do, like a Lee Harvey Oswald, not trying to do this for political power or celebrity or anything. He was just targeting everyday citizens like himself. And he had this very scary sort of half-typed, written suicide or whatever kind of manifesto letter you want to call it, which you do obviously see echoed in in the film targets as well. But he says, um, I don't really understand myself these days. Uh, He had written, I suppose to, I I suppose to be an average reasonable and intelligent young man. However, lately, and I can't recall when started, I have been a victim of many unusual and irrational thoughts. And so uh, he wasn't taken alive. Charles Whitman was shot and killed 90 minutes into his attack by uh, two Austin Police Department officers. So crazy freaking story. Um, so this yeah. is ripped right from the headlines. Yeah, and it really, there was shockwaves through the country uh, for all the reasons we're talking about. But then, and I only realized this tonight, is just less than a year later, you know, they were rolling cameras on this film Target. So it was yeah. really still in the heat of this incident. Yes. Mm-hmm. So I think now not to be- mention the president got shot in 1963, right? So yeah. I mean, like, just yeah. the whole decade is just right. Yeah, but then that. the Beatles happened, and that kind of like canceled <laughs> it out a little bit. I'm actually not even kidding. No, yeah, I'm not kidding. I know what you're you know, say- I know like, what you're yeah. saying. Yeah, yeah. like I, that's what my mom out. said. My mom yeah. said that you know JFK was huge, and it was a nightmare. Yeah. Um, but uh, she said that it months later in the spring of '64. For some reason, everybody was just like flipped. You know, it just was felt like the it felt like an optimistic '60s was happening again. Mm-hmm. Sort of, right, you know? right. I could see that. So, yeah. uh, but you know, like I think there was a pause in the um, the grim right. reality between '63. Mm-hmm. Well, you uh, see that contrast too with like like you said, the summer of love and the hippies and like let's rebuild society, man, right. and like let's Led just have by a good the Beatles. time and 
Yeah, exactly. Right, right. But I mean, yeah, it's just that's so fascinating with the six with that jerk back and forth of like how right. the good time and hippie time right. and then the like the uh, like bad vibes. <laughs> yeah. Bad cusp. 68 with this and yeah. well, uh, this incident in this film and then uh uh, and then Manson 69 yeah. coming happening right when Woodstock is happening. You know, how about them apples? Jeez, and then, uh, yeah, and then you're Woodstock over. Woodstock versus over. Altamont. That's yeah. the six. Yeah, right exactly. Then. So yeah, there's yeah, there's yeah. there's something going on there. Right. Anyway. All right. Well, now I think it's a good time just to get into the background of this movie because Marcus uh, did uh, allude to this. It does have a pretty fascinating and unusual, probably unprecedented background in a lot of ways. So where. Cool. So Targets was greenlit on the fly by Roger Corman in lieu of Peter Bogdanovich. He was 28 years old, and he was helping Roger Corman out with a biker-themed hit movie, The Wild Angels, in 1966. And sort of to reward him for that, he said, all right, let's greenlight this movie and, and, and uh, make a movie together. Obviously, it came with a couple of caveats, though. And the caveats, you know, because Roger Corman is infamous for never wanting to let anything go to waste. If he can turn any sort of footage or any leftover materials into money, you know, he was going to do that. And basically... He I had, never lost a dime. Right. He's that kind of guy, you know? Right, <laughs> right, right. So apparently he had 20 minutes of a Boris Karloff movie, which is what you see in the movie, the actual sort of 60s, uh, I don't know what, hammer horror-esque kind of, you know, gothic castle, you know. Uh, AIP, American International Pictures, those right. were huge, Mask of the Red Death and, and right. so on. All and the keep, and by the way, yeah. there, there's a cusp MVP uh, with Boris, mm -hmm. you see Jack Nicholson. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Jack Nicholson, who if you were watching this film in 68, would be like, oh yeah, that kind of guy who isn't really working out and he's kind of nothing in yeah. the background. Yeah. You know, and then like, but then dot, dot, yeah. dot, easy writer and he yeah. is enormous and he's on the cover of time so um yeah and and he's a he's a he's he's a cusper 101 and by the way he mm -hmm. was busy in 68 with one of our other choices which he wrote head for the the monkeys film so right, um, right. yeah so you know right you've got jack I kept waiting again. for him every time he's on screen i kept waiting for him to say want to, anybody want a piece of pizza <laughs> <laughs> do you want a piece of pizza all right um so <laughs> Roger Corman had 20 minutes of a Karloff movie, uh, basically, and he was looking to turn this into a feature-length film any way he possibly could. So he wanted Peter B. to finish that movie for him. He wanted, um, he wanted Peter B. to film 20 more minutes of material over the course of two days. 20 minutes for two days is pretty crazy uh yeah with 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 boris karloff to kind of you know get to 40 minutes of boris footage and then he wanted to shoot him to shoot 40 more minutes with other actors and then voila we got a new boris uh, karloff starring aip gothic horror film that we can release no big deal right um so so that was what he basically did um and he offered um Peter B. six grand to make uh, to make the movie like you know that's what he made on it and he said that uh, Polly uh, who Polly Platt who we mentioned earlier that was his partner at the time big creative collaborator we talked about her at at length in the mask episode the one fucking hour in mask mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so further reading definitely check that out but so they were trying to rack their brains on like what are we gonna do with Boris Karloff to make this thing work you know like this classic horror star how can we make him relevant to a cusp audience and yeah. uh the story goes that peter b had an epiphany one morning while shaving and that the idea was that they would make a thriller um based on the first scene where it would be set in a movie theater where the terror that's the name of the footage that uh, you see in the movie the movie within the movie and the movie that roger corman had already shot 20 minutes of <laughs> right is right. playing on the screen and Boris Karloff is watching himself from the seats. And when the lights come up, Boris is actually sitting next to Roger Corman. They were actually going to put him in the movie. And he turns oh. to Roger and says, this is the worst movie I've ever seen. Um, and so <laughs> that was the starting point of this idea uh, of, of trying to utilize Boris as a washed up sort of you know, classic horror star, and then he's he, he's, he's going to walk away from it all. He's going to quit, and that's the beginning of the movie is that he quits. But then yeah. entering in Polly Platt, who really is uh, an uncredited genius in the early creative collaborations of Peter B. We noted this at, in the other episode. You know, you see a notice decline in the Peter B. product as soon as Polly yes, Platt leaves the a, picture. There is a 
pre or there's a, a post poly uh, era for a Bogdanovich and uh, yeah, you know Daisy true. Miller <laughs> at Long Last Love, yeah, Wonton, you know the dog movies, who saved Hollywood or whatever. Like dude, Nickelodeon. <laughs> those movies, by the way, I mean they are kind of slow. Kind of slow. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, that. she's back. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, so uh, Polly deserves like at least half credit. And I know we litigated this before, but um, yeah, just specifically on this film, though, if we just say on this for one second, uh, the double P, you know, they worked very closely. They were basically like a creative partnership, you know, oh, but yeah. he was still getting credit as the director. But she edited it, um, well, co edited, co wrote it. She did all the costumes, the sets. She basically was uh, doing production, you know, writing the checks, as they say. And, um, and what the note I've always read is um, uh, he was the verbal one and she was the visual one who could iterate, you know, what he's getting at. Uh, and actually make it happen and look really great on, on uh, the screen. She was the real force behind, well, um, uh, you know, what Peter's um, yeah. inspirations and inclinations. She's well, let's just, not bury and, the and lead, she also though. checked his ego. Oh, oh sorry, what did you say? I was just going to say, let's not bury the lead, though. I mean, it's Polly's oh, idea to in, to take Charles Whitman and to bring it into this idea. Oh, mm. that's, a good, that's a nice detail. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, she, she thought that in order to make this movie more cusp more on you know more relevant to now was to add a modern killer what the idea of a modern killer would be in this movie not an obviously in a horror gothic you know thing what's what's a modern version of a killer and yeah. it was something she remembered that um a friend i think from the esquire had said to one to peter or something someone told peter like you should make a movie about charles whitman or something and so it was her idea to oh. basically say okay let's take the Charles Whitman thing and put it into this. And so you have yeah. this mashup of it's, both the ideas. It, really, it's a brilliant high concept uh, and it's executed beautifully. We'll get into that. But just uh, if you just take a step back, um, that was not happening. This is a this is a high concept film. Basically, it's it's partially born of um, sort of an accident or like like you know like a practical you know like uh, problem solving, you yeah. know. But also on her part, if if she did make those connections, it's really very brilliant thinking. Um, yeah, uh, pro it's problem uh, solution. It's it's you know solution to a problem. Yeah, but it really is a very inspired. And I, I know that. we sound like idiots, but like it really is a perfect example of of cusp thinking, where it's like. <laughs> One foot. Cusp. Yeah. I'm, gonna, no, I'm I trying to win it. a bet here. I, no. I love we're making love we're it. making a point. We're gonna we're yeah. gonna come out. We're, we are writing a book, the three of us, called Cusp, you know, Cusp 1967 <laughs> to 68. So sorry, early promotion. Marcus, so um, Marcus, I, you're I saying something. Well, one of the something. just just to Polly for a second. One of the little anecdotes I heard is that she was asking, like, you know, when they were watching the terror. She was asking Peter, or like, why aren't these movies scary anymore? You know? Right. And, and part of that question, you know, gave birth to the idea that to have Boris Karloff actually, um, to, do, to do it as a movie in a mov movie within a movie, mm -hmm. the terror is the movie within targets. Right. And that Karloff will actually vocalize that question, you know, and like, mm. and you'll, you'll see, be able to just, he will be the, he will like take the uh, perspective from the, of the audience, you know, saying like, <laughs> These mm. old movies are why why they why they aren't acceptable for modern audiences and you know he's almost at a loss for it himself but he knows that it's coming and it's just such a like you said you know such a brilliant contrast with not only cinema like hey American t movie tastes are beyond what the terror you yes. know, from 1963 is now right. you know in 1968 but also society is yeah. going insane too, you know? Right. So I yeah. just love how it's a dual contrast between, you right. know, it's, it's such a, it's such a movie about movies. I mean, there's, there's the, there's the, uh, you know, the relevance of what was going on at the time with Whitman and, uh, you know, and Kennedy and stuff, but also just that it's a movie about movies yeah. is such a great aspect of yeah. it too, you know? And that's probably like a yeah. big Peter B thing too, you know? Well, I was just going to say right. just a tiny side note, just to, yeah, you guys want to chime in on this. Sure. It's funny. Uh, there was also an interesting conceit that maybe he's poly, maybe he's polys or both of their ideas. But you know, the thing about Bogdanovich you have to remember is he's a huge old timey, old school Hollywood, you know, guy. He's yeah. an, like an old timey Hollywood file. And, you know, he would just pour through books and facts and figures about like, you know, yeah. um, well, that's when, you know, Ford, uh, you know, started doing serials and that's when he met so-and-so and like yeah. he gets into the minutia and he would hang yeah. out at the Hollywood book and poster shop on Hollywood Boulevard, yep. you know, mm -hmm. 
and what I'm saying is, it's it's interesting because he is in the film. <laughs> he is Peter Bogdanovich is in the film as a director, a young director. Mm -hmm. But he 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 gets to say things like, "Oh, they don't make movies like that anymore." Like when he's right. watching an old Karloff film mm -hmm. on television. So he's imbuing in the film. He's right. also getting away with another thing, which is like being able to be a big movie nerd, <laughs> and 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 throw that into the plot too. You know, because right. that's the thing. Because he is he he's not in a way he's he's cusping out, but but kind of both feet are still in classical hollywood mm -hmm. you know it's just uh this is a classical hollywood a kid fanboy who is though entering the hard weirdness of 68 and on you know so um mm -hmm. yeah his spirit i guess i'm saying is in uh hollywood you know and that's oh, right. um, that's he's the perfect guy to make a movie like this mm -hmm. right right he's got the he's, yeah he worships hollywood but he also views it as like high art too right so he's well, trying course, to live yeah. up to that you know so yeah yeah I, I read that he like he kept a he kept an index card of every movie he ever saw and saw like over 400 right. movies a year right. you know and then yes. he was a you know he was a journalist you know and it would interview filmmakers and so he already yeah. had all these conversations with like hitchcock or well, whoever right. even Hawks exactly or, you know, so, he already, so he's always trotting out these little like you know gems and of like wisdom that those directors had imparted on him and it is fascinating mm -hmm. like you said he would like hang out at those clubs and stuff and hang out at those restaurants go to screenings but he would like kind of he almost wrote himself into that world right right like, kind of like and then he wrote himself into this fucking movie too right. I know. exactly <laughs> yeah we should say yeah. that uh so peter b plays the director of the terror inside of targets the movie within the movie and that is kind of a very interesting choice. It's like uh, we were uh, when Ramy and I were rewatching the movie, we we're kind of like thinking, you know, this is kind of proto Woody Allen in a way to sort of like put yourself in this position. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. you know, it is it is interesting. You know, it's not like a show it's also cheap performance, but it's yeah, it is cheap. Mm -hmm. And I think that is probably the reason why. I think that's the reason why he put himself in there. Somebody fell through, and he's like, "Fuck it, I'll just do it." You know, it could whatever. be, yeah. yeah but you know, I like it, him yeah. as an actor. I mean, we all love him in Sopranos, decades oh. later, with his <laughs> yeah. big water bottle, as you know, <laughs> talking to Melfi. <laughs> so yeah, uh, yeah. Peter's that. Peter's a weird one. Like uh, you know, sometimes it's a little iffy, and then sometimes he's great. And like, yeah. I actually like his performances. So sure, you know, yeah. Um, this one. So it doesn't yeah. come off as egomaniacal either because it's so restrained, you know, and he cut himself out yeah. here and there and like, you right. know, he's not overdoing his, no, he's not overdoing his role, you know. No, no, no. Well, no. I had heard one last thing. It's not uh, Polly, uh, one of the things that are, are the post Polly <laughs> period yeah. is she kept his ego in check mm -hmm. uh, because he respected her and he yeah. would actually listen and go like, hey, Peter, don't say stuff like that. You sound like a total asshole. You yeah, know, like she yeah. would say that. Yeah. And he would go, wow, okay, gotcha. But then he, she's gone. When she's out of the picture, he's yeah. with Sybil Shepherd. He went wildly yeah. Bogdanovich on yeah, everybody's we ass. Say, we should say, uh, as you know, we show exhibit A through Z on the one fucking hour of... Uh, on the one fucking hour on Mask, you know, how yeah. Peter B. really has one of the Hall of Fame egos of all time. Um, <laughs> but just shifting gears here for a second because i think this is something that uh this film targets has in common with last week's film point blank is this idea of an older generation actor uh being paired with this in, in the case of boris karloff here or lee marvin with point blank being paired with a cuspy you know 20s uh, filmmakers who have like mm -hmm. you know some really wild cool weird ideas yeah. and I think that is something True. that is really cool with this and I think that's a good segue into just Boris Karloff um, who's in this yeah. movie and um, you know who, who does a great job uh, playing um, I love it yeah playing this character I love when it when an actor could have that one final killer performance yes. it's like Peter Sellers and being there yeah you totally. know like ending yeah. on a beautiful note yeah totally right. yeah right. And just, um, I just recently we watched Ed Wood. Sorry, and yes. like you know, there's so much of like Karloff and Bo and Lugosi. And I was just thinking this, like how Lugosi's last films ended up with like Ed Wood <laughs> Studios. Yeah. You know, he didn't and get then, a Targets. No, he didn't no, get he a Targets. No, no, he didn't. <laughs> but good this example. Is, this yeah. is this is crazy. Like you know, when this movie was being made in in, in 1967, he was 80 years old. He was uh, Boris Karloff was 80 years old. He was in very poor health. Mm -hmm. suffering from emphysema he had uh he had uh, rheumatoid arthritis and he only had uh half of one lung i guess and he spent oh, he spent time between takes in a wheelchair with an oxygen mask on no. and he wore braces on both legs and had difficulty standing or walking without a cane 
and and the weakness of his legs is visible in some of the scenes but he he mm -hmm. gave it a great performance despite yeah, all that you killer. never know it and, and then and it's great also that he lived long enough to actually see the finished film and um also yeah. to enjoy the accolades that came with that right, performance. right. Yeah, you know? that's the beautiful part of um, yeah. the final performances that they get like a, you know, they, they get to um, have a little a different kind of respect in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a nice warm context. And one thing I'll say is, Jesus Christ, the guy was born in the 1800s. And that's the thing. It's like, um, you have to, I can't imagine. Wow. I cannot imagine to be born before the 20th century and then wow. go be going through it, you know? And yeah. um, mm -hmm. there's that great line, uh, he, they're, they're driving to the drive-in at night and they're going through the totally San Fernando Valley and it's one car dealership after another, you know? And he just looks out the window. I love that line. And he's like, God, this is such an ugly city now, you know, or right. something. God, what an ugly town this has become. Yeah, and because uh, yeah. he probably was God, remembering what an ugly city this has become right yeah and it's like uh you know because he was remembering old hollywood you know right it's just like it's trash dump so i guess what yeah. i'm saying is everything was new to a person that old like these these horrific murders were unimaginable probably in the 30s oh, you know these God. kind of charles whitman things but even just automobiles <laughs> you know, like, yeah, right. like at all <laughs> well <laughs> bogdanovich mean? said that that karloff said something like that was the most true line you know that I've, that's ever been written or something like yeah. that he gave that that was his review of that was his favorite carlos favorite line in the movie and said oh, that wow. he carried oh, the most truth wow. well that's so good <laughs> and and and, but, and one thing we yeah. should say real quick too just like and we touched on i mean this is a high concept movie like you know they're they're operating Polly platt and um peter b are operating under this restriction if you will like how do we turn this tw 20 minutes of whatever into something new which is super awesome uh, but the but the reason why the concept also really works and why it is just a great idea is because not only is it a commentary on the violence in media, which we've talked also about, but it is also um, thematically works with the Hollywood's old meeting the new as well too, and it's perfect. Mm -hmm. You see Boris Karloff's face like in the crosshairs of a you know in mm -hmm. like a bullseye, you know, like 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 you see like you know that, and it's kind of like. Hollywood is going to kill all of its like old, you know, icons mm, and its right, old, right, you know, right. thing. And it does, it also works in that way too, is that this is like, you know, because and, it, and is it really was out. happening. Like right. it's a living embodiment of what was happening where, right. you know, you got to remember like, okay, like so many changes. And I, I know we're being silly with the word cuss, but just, but really what I'm no. saying is like, there were movies in 1967 and, and, and before they would sell themselves on like a cast of hundreds starring Ray Moland, you right. know, and like uh, yeah. Lana Starkwood or whatever. Yeah. And like then, though, in the middle of 69, you've got, oh, it's a movie with just some fucking guys in it or something. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. it's like Jack Nicholson. And it's like yeah. Jack Nicholson is not what movie stars used to be. Right. You know what I mean? It was no. just about the first, like weird different. And then you get Elliot Gould a little later. And like, yeah. you know, these people are very oddly shaped movie stars they're not yeah. you know robinson so um you're absolutely right that like there is almost a representation we're killing this, all that this casting yeah of like i'm on my way out and this is just this is a new town <laughs> you yeah. know what i mean yeah no t no um 100 so so the movie basically as we've said starts basically with you see boris karloff is you know disenchanted uh you know by his latest uh film he's just sitting through a screening of his latest movie and um he's not into it whatsoever he you know th there's the, the the magic isn't there it's not as effective anymore time has moved on he's moved on and so he wants to quit the business and so you sort of see that play out and while you do see that play out we have a b storyline which is obviously totally different very disturbing out of left wow. field which Can is, i just say i like yeah. the linkage yeah. which was just like cars on the highway right? yes right right no of course of course and it, it is Bobby Thompson is the name of the character who plays the Charles Whitman inspired uh, sniper. Uh, he's his backstory is he's a young Vietnam vet. That's basically pretty much all we get. Um, yeah. But the way we're introduced to him is very effective because we're introduced to him with Amazing. these scenes that have a like a, a, a ratcheting up of intensity. We're first introduced to him where he's at the gun shop. He's got Karloff in his crosshairs as he's trying out this gun. And then he's and then mm -hmm. we see him in a second sequence where he's pointing a gun at somebody at a firing range. And so 
right then and there, we're seeing that there's something disturbing yeah. going on beneath the surface Can of this I add, character. What, in the development of this kind of archetypal person, for me, the creepiest scene as he's unfolding as, as, as a character in this film yeah. is when he arrives you know, at the house yeah. and he's, and like, you know, the family doesn't quite know that he came in yeah. and he's just coldly silently staring at uh, family photos in the living room while everyone's like in the kitchen or something. Yeah. And I was like, that was really good. And then you know? on top of mm-hmm. that, you have that amazing shot. I think it's a little bit after that where there's a shot of him in bed smoking a cigarette and it's like yes. his face, like half his face is blacked out and his eyes Brilliant. are in the dark. You can't see his eyes Brilliant. <clears throat> and he's just scary. It's like Faceless a David Lynch. In shadow. It's like a, yeah, like a David Lynch yeah, kind it's of It's beautifully vibe. done. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's, that's really scary. And then we get, <laughs> so it's, it, it's ratcheting up to this point where we see him basically writing his manifesto suicide whatever you want to call that you know where he's yeah. writing on the typewriter and you just see the words in red typewriter ink <laughs> yeah. you're just seeing d i, I e period you know and you're like holy shit um but the setting of where that's taking place the way that house looks okay yes it looks Which like poly designed that's right she did but it, it has this quality. I don't know if they were going for it, but I hate to bring up Natural Born Killers again. But oh, <laughs> Only two <laughs> per, episode. <laughs> per episode. I hate to bring it up again, but it's like, you know, that was like they were going for that sort of like, you they know, were. TV sitcom set. They were. Like, well, I asked, uh, I actually Killers. asked um, Peter Bogdanovich. I had to do a Q&A with him about targets. Oh. And, I, and I went into that. I was like, what about that set design? And I wasn't mentioning Polly or anything like that. But like, right. he said that it was very intentional and it was constructed, uh-huh. you know, by uh, trying to make sort of the ultimate suburban household. You know, that was the mm-hmm. idea. And almost like, um, like it's furnished by like a corporation, a company or something. Yeah. Like it's not, it doesn't have a personal touch. It's just right. like, like a hotel paintings. Right. It's or so ugly sparse. paintings. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, Yeah, and sparse, very sparse. So sparse and boxy. It's obviously a set in a studio, but it it Mm -hmm. works. Part of it's the budget too, I think, right? Sure. You know. Yeah, but I think it works, like because it's like uh, Ramy was saying this too. It's like they're in this almost like fifties dollhouse kind of idea, and it really works to sort of like subvert the themes of like the clean cut, you know, fifties, you know, facade. It's almost like Devo or something. It's like. Like this strange yeah, antiseptic genius. vision of uh, <laughs> right. what's that? Subgenius or just subversion of that fifties oh, kind of yeah. thing that would yeah. But, you know, so like a, um, the, I want to mention got, two things though about aesthetic choices that that help because there's it's um there's there, there's that but there's a really significant component that I really always respond to. Mm-hmm. There is no score. I was just going to say that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, great. Okay. No. So so no, go no, with no, that. No, I was just going to say that. Just like um, yeah. Yeah. like like blank walls. Yeah. Blank sound, uh-huh. faintly hearing dogs barking in, in the background after he yeah. shoots people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, what do you guys think? Sound design. Marcus, you were going to say something. What were you going to say? Oh, uh, yeah, no, I love that too. Uh, you only hear the radio and then the, you know, the sort of the music that you hear. I mean, that'd be my, my one. The, you, you hear like the same records over and over here and there in, in the movie, you know, but it's for the most part, there, there's no score. Right. Yeah, exactly. Digest. There's no music. score. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I guess he said Peter said he got the idea from Rear Window, which I thought was a funny like uh, of reference. Of course he did. Yeah, um, huge oh. crock. But um, <laughs> but but we we should also describe like this scene where you're seeing this set right, and then it's this ch- absolutely chilling, fucked up scene where he shoots his wife. It's and the incredible. way it's played, and then of course, like he shoots um, probably his wife and his wife's mom, I think. Oh yeah, I think. And then the right. and then the, ba- the delivery boy, or his mom, or something. And then so he yeah. shoots, he shoots, he shoots them. No music, and that's a very you know modernist Definitely. choice for this. Dogs movie. barking faintly. Yep. Children playing faintly. Yep. And it plays out. Yeah, mm-hmm. absolutely bone chilling. And you're right, very forward thinking. And I'm sure yeah. somewhat influenced by modern European filmmaking at the time. Totally. So big ups mm-hmm. to Bogdanovich doing that. And not unlike the other cusper from last week. Right. You know, uh, Borman. Um, Borman. Last thing there, I'll, I'll there's just... a lot. There's a lot of great things just in that house. Sorry. Are you still talking about the murder? Yeah. I just wanted to like, before we leave the house. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, just, just one more thing on the murder. I just wanted to say like, you know, and, and I got to give props to Ramey for shouting this out because... On an alternate universe, the other 1968 film that we would have covered is is In Cold Blood, 
And there is also the similarity, oddly, creepily in this movie, that he's taking the time to drag the bodies, just like in Cold Blood, mm-hmm. and to tuck them in to bed, you know? And then, and you're seeing this right. with no music, and there's that proto steady cam scanning the floors and everything. Mm-hmm. Very, probably the most effective scene in the entire And it film. plays out. It's, it's a little like Psycho uh, after yeah. the shower scene, sure. a little bit, but yeah. even less stylized. Um, yeah. But, uh, well, actually, I thought you were going to mention Pretty Poison, actually. Oh. Because sure. it's not dissimilar. There's yeah. this carnage in this quiet suburban household. Sure. You know, um, there's some similarities. Yeah. Same year. But just Same the tucking year. of the people in bed is, is what yeah, that, happened. Well, that. apparently sure. that's what Whitman did to his, with his family when he murdered oh. his mom. Like okay. he, put, he, he tucked them all into bed. And so wow. they were kind of copying that. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah. So there's, there's, some, there's some like straight up Whitman like lines in the movie. Like when he right. goes to the ammo store and says, like, uh, you know, the guy's like, "What are you gonna do with all this ammo?" He's like, "I'm gonna go shoot some pigs." And like, yeah, I guess right. that's what yeah. was a direct, supposedly a direct. That, that's a kind of a zodiac it. kind of thing. It is know? little yeah. pigs feel that way a little bit. The bus yeah. or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. I, 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 right. I love that that tracking shot in the house that you're talking about. That feels like a steady, oh. but you know it's not. Cause it's 1968. You know, yeah, it exactly. feels like a little bit sticky with the dolly or it whatever. It is. It's but, like. Yeah. There's another <laughs> really long um, take that's like a five minute take or something that's uh, uh, before the murder when the parents are watching TV. Oh, yeah. It's so fucking cool. It's like, yeah. uh, you know, it goes from, it travels different rooms and goes back. And then yeah. it's like, it's a whole long one take that's like five minutes long that it doesn't even, it's so cool. It doesn't even register really because you're just sort of in the movie. It's not being really flashy, like, look at my one take, right. you know, but it, it's done so well. Right. Weird right. compositions and, um, too. Really weird. Yeah, positions yeah yeah right there's like a jump cut and there's like a hidden jump cut in yeah. there too it's oh. like it's it's pretty amazing yeah, like um pretty cool stuff so Can I, if we're yeah. being in this neighborhood if i just could make one little other kind of blanket observation about like yeah. the, the tone and the mood because sure. i think this is one of the great mood setting films you know what i mean like uh mm-hmm. he just does it pitch perfectly so i just have a little note here a little rant on like how I could imagine European critics and filmmakers responding to this film. Yeah. And it must have really turned them on because they were really fascinated by seeing America. So think like Zabriskie Point a few years later by oh, you know, Antonioni. Yeah. Yeah. So my note is just like, this is a pure depiction of freeways and billboards and AM radio and soda pop and muscle cars and candy bars and laugh tracks and general anomi, you know, um, that antiquated term. And uh, it, it must have really um, captured people's uh, fascination because you have to think if someone's in Paris, San Fernando Valley is Mars. It's very yeah. weird. And I think yeah. that the brilliance of filmmakers like Bogdanovich at the time being American, but they're taking a second look. Like often um, foreign directors would look at America kind of weird, like Borman did actually with Los Angeles, right? Sure. Last week. But like like this is an American kind of going, wait a minute, right. this is weird. And he was picking up the aspects of the general weirdness yeah. of sort of almost the most perfect kind of American place for the 60s, which is the San Fernando Valley, which is like that the suburban house and just that whole plasticine right. prefab world. So yeah. um and it's and, and and all with no score. Yeah. Genius. Yeah, and I, I just want to say too, because we did bring up Antonioni last week. Um and, and I think Antonioni deserves a lot of credit. I more know. Th- for modernizing American cinema <laughs> in a lot of ways. Because really? um you can see on Antonioni's influence in this movie too. Uh, I just want to I want to use this as a segue to another just incredible set piece in this movie which is <laughs> the freeway sniping scene probably another one of the most insane scenes in the oh movie. My God. But when he's starting to walk up the uh, stairs to go to the to that to that whatever that tower um you see all of the industrial, you know, pipes and steam and stuff and they're even painted certain colors maybe that um, maybe they didn't even have the budget to do that you know but it but right. it, it feels I like mean, red I, desert that little section i know feels like walking through the industrial it, it, it caught his period. eye like it's the the, yeah. the the barren quality to it all and the sound design of it like 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 his soul is barren like yeah. in the way that antonio is antonioni is referencing the inner soul of a person externally through the landscapes yeah. this is like this is what this guy's soul looks like 
which mm-hmm. is just like this quietly cold, unsettlingly quiet place full of nobody yeah. and just objects, you know, uh, right. mechanical objects. Oof, yeah. He said they just got lucky right. when he was there. It's incredible. Oh, you know, really? Well, you go. know, they scout and they look, and I think they went for sure. the most thing the most place that most was like that yeah like anonymous mm-hmm. barren uh industrial area yeah just to me it did, did really fit and there's it. a lot of that yeah it really <laughs> in, it really like felt central like, valley yeah no, but it just really felt like red desert and that like for like literally yeah. three minutes and then Good um, call and then he and then he, he climbed well we, we said red desert for point blank as well too so it's like these exactly. two movies are just like huge for the cusps um but then we get to the sniper scene, which is just absolutely chilling. We got to talk about it again. It's so effective, just because obviously he's just shooting random people as they're driving in the freeway, which is so <laughs> fucked up. God. And but of course he's, you know, they're playing it all at the distance. You know, we don't, we're not cutting into the cars as people are getting Never. shot. Never. We're not, we're not, we're not, we're We're yeah. seeing what he's seeing. Right. And that's so fucked up because everything's played at a distance and mm-hmm. it's realistic and chilling. You, and you can't hear them. Like, like it's so yeah. far away, you can't hear someone screaming, even if they are. Oh, it's my like, God. It's just like dehumanizing uh, mm-hmm. them, you know, and is, is the way that, yeah, like we're seeing it through not only just how he sees it, but literally through his POV, you Yeesh. know, and it's just so fucked up. And, um, you know, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's just one of the most effective oh, I know, like, I know. parts of the movie. Great editing, too, by the way. Totally. This film... Uh, oh yeah, you know, like if, like I, someone mentioned earlier, like uh, Marcus is like there's there's a lot of really Bravo filmmaking, but it's all very subtle and like uh, the um, the editing is really engaging and interesting and gets the job done. But it's also very creative, and but it's never it never like shows its hand to you, like it no. never is, is show off. Too you know? flashy. Mm-hmm. And, and, but I noted it earlier on in the film, and I went, "Wow, look at that editing, uh, you know, yeah. uh, construction." And that's definitely way- happening in the freeway shooting is what i'm saying yeah yeah the way they weave the stories together you know with like yeah. uh you know like uh Karloff's in a car and then it'll cut to bobby in the car right you know and then like uh there's you know a, a drink like in, in, in Karloff's hand will will cut to like a the can a tin can that bobby the kid is <laughs> shooting like later on and there's a lot of just forethought that goes into connecting uh, and the editing to connect those two yeah, pieces. Yeah, absolutely. Those and I guess fifty percent poly on that one. Tiny yeah, and, little and, thing. And, oh, go ahead. Well, go just ahead. it's. I mean, it's got you. I think it really helps as an audience member. It helps you create all the suspense and anticipation of how are these two stories going to be reconnected again? Mm-hmm. You know, we see them at the beginning that, that that they are like briefly connected, just in the location of being on Sunset Boulevard. But the whole time in your mind, you're kind of like wondering, like, how are these going to yeah. sync up again? I know sure. they're going to. And that editing helps like provide that like sort of like suspenseful yeah. like Continuity. reminder. Yeah. Tiny shout out. We just lost the actor who uh, is shot at that industrial side <laughs> spot. The worker who's, who catches the killer, Gary Kent. I know. Died uh, a week ago. Um, we had died, nothing to do with it. He <laughs> died 24 hours after we uh, suggested targets uh, as a potential episode yeah. for the show. So. Yeah. Uh, oddly, we're kind of two for two, but we don't mean this. I mean, with Kenneth Anger and Gary Kent, it's just this freaky thing that's yeah. happening. I mean, yeah. oh my One god! One fucking hour curse. Yeah. Anyway, um, uh, and by uh, the way, further reading, he's a really interesting guy. He made yeah. his own movie. He's in tons of movies. He's a wild, he's awesome. interesting, classic yeah. sort of like underground, yeah. uh, you know, um, yeah. uh, movie uh, person. Yeah, Gary Kent. Look him up. Yeah, big deal. What are you gonna say, Marcus? Before we leave that freeway section, just gotta mention that they shot all that illegally too. Yeah, you know, like the the cars careening off the road and people running, uh, opening the doors and running in, wow. running into the ditch and throwing Pretty themselves shot. in the ditch as if they'd been shot like yeah. uh, and there's no yeah, camera in sight stolen. for the other drivers they're like what the fuck's going on yeah yeah the camera is the, so far away right right yeah, and the police were yeah all, yeah and the police well i mean just, there's real, no right? permit there's they didn't lock they didn't lock down or anything they're just like stealing the that's shots, what i mean too so. but like yeah, they couldn't yeah. even there might have been a camera on the side of the road in a different kind of filmmaking but it was yeah, so right. distant that it's just like what the fuck is wrong with yeah. you what are you doing yeah, yeah. you know right right yeah why and, are you acting uh, like you were shot yeah yeah i guess and, they saw all yeah. the all the driving stuff they shot illegally which i just said another like inspiring thing like sure. oh man just go out and st- steal your movie for real you gotta do it and i guess how they did it you know obviously it's not like a crazy thing but they just basically had two-way radios you know they were communicating like okay as they're driving okay you're shot you know and wow. then they just swerve you know? <laughs> yeah wow. and that's how they would do it like, like okay we can I see you that. we see your car okay three two one bam you know and that was it so <laughs> it's pretty 
pretty crazy. Um, but let's 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 just move it along here as we're getting. So now the movie is building up to. This is such a weird concept. This drive-in movie theater appearance of Boris Karloff is going to be live at this drive-in, and he's sort of looking at it as like his big send-off where he wants to say something super profound and got to shout out that the weird drive-in guy that wants to interview him, right? On well, he's I'm assuming he's like a radio DJ. He's like a 40-year-old yeah. teenager. Like, all right, let's get squiggy and wiggy here with yeah. uh, Boris Karloff or, you know, whatever. <laughs> And um, and he has like a very um, regrettable haircut. Oh, the and, worst! And like a weird, like hot assistant with like weird glasses. Um, who doesn't talk? It's yeah. that kind of Phil Spectory kind of like yes. um, pop culture impresario <laughs> kind of like a jive man. Yeah, it's nice touch. He really gooses the movie for a minute. Whoever yeah, that actor and is, he's just like not having it for a minute. He's ginchy is that the term, Marcus? He's very ginchy. I don't yes. know that word, but I like oh, it. Oh, really? Um, okay, yeah. look at it. Everybody look up. He wrote it for. He wrote that part for that guy. I guess like Hmm. some friend of his or something. Yeah, he's a weird character actor who pops up and he's actually look him up. He. I was looking at his IMDb and I was like, oh my god, he's in Straight Time. And I was like, who is he in Straight Time? (laughs) Oh my god, I know who he is. He's in Broadway. Danny Rose. Yes, he is. He's in the diner. Uh, He is. I know exactly who that guy is. Holy shit. Anyway, further reading. There you go. Moving on, okay, drive moving in. Moving on up. So that we we we're getting to the drive in, and obviously, you know, from the water tower, freeway sniper, whatever thing, you know, um, Bobby's on the run, and this all kind of meets to a head here with the driveway premiere of the uh, uh, um, of the terror with Boris Karloff live in person. And of course, that's where Bobby's running to, and he decides to hide in, inside the movie theater screen, which I think is. Very chilling. This, the screen is shooting the audience. I know. This idea that this movie is going to actually kill you is fucking yes. insane. Okay. Like, it's just a, a metaphor. But it's very, Wild. very, very disturbing. Um, this Wild. this idea of being shot at while watching a movie at really a drive-in. Is. And Tom, you were mentioning that that was pretty... Well, just a side note. I can imagine. I'm sure this played on a, the bottom of a triple bill at a... Drive in, <laughs> and I can only imagine since this is rendered so horrifically and so vividly with the no score and like you know the flat kind of uh, you know European filmmaking, that must have kind of chilled people to the bone to watch yeah. this m- murder at a drive-in. You know, yeah, it's it it sounds- so dry. <laughs> sounds like kind of like a like a shock thing that the Alamo Draft House would do like thirty years later. I was like, targets at the right. drive-in. You know, yeah, <laughs> I was thinking yeah, the same thing. Totally. They, yeah. There's another movie, Anguish, right? That does oh. that with like a movie in a movie, and it's like um, oh, Anguish, yeah. right, 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 right. That's right. You're right. And, uh, I was also thinking of Angst a little bit, only in mm. that post murdering his family oh, scene where he's dragging the bodies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, a little bit, you know. Sans the tiny side shoulder. note, uh, just about the killer is i'm glad this guy didn't become a bigger actor i'm glad he's not recognizable like oh he was that guy from the gilligan's island or something <laughs> like because i don't know who this man is and right. i've never seen him in anything else so he might as well be this character and this murderer true you know what i mean guys like i love when that happens where it just he wouldn't like oh that guy wound up on uh you know the alice tv show as the cook or something right <laughs> You know what I mean? He's just, right. he's he just, just want to when you go back and watch Targets, you just want to laugh because he's some sort of well, character. He's just distracting. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> right. So it's perfect. He's just, I don't know who that actor is. Is he an actor? Is he a killer? What's going on? I don't so know. that adds to it all. Yeah. Anyway. It, it, no, it uh, 100% does. And let's get into the like culmination. Oh, God, he, I was just looking up his, his IMDb. He's not in a lot of stuff. He's in like five yeah. things. Wow. There you go. There you go. There you go. But um, so it culminates to this moment where obviously he's taking, you know, he's he's she snipes the projectionist. He he's shooting yeah. at people down from the screen. It's it's totally chilling, very effective stuff. And then uh, we see this, you know, like people are starting to figure out what's happening. They're realizing yeah. if they're the horns hard. start uh, like yeah. again sound design. Yeah, the frantic, panicky horns yeah. start honking. Yeah, and it gets louder. I love that. It's like a slow ripple. Like yeah. like two people, two cars know that this is happening. Right, and then more, and then more, and then they and then people yeah. don't know quite what happened, but something right. really bad's happening. And they're throwing food at each other. Like fucking pay attention. There's a sniper. You know what I mean? There's a sniper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, throwing what? sodas at people's cars yeah i know wow yeah brilliantly done and great editing again that sequence is edited for you know like really like panicky yeah. suspense yeah. like uh, covering like a lot of ground do you know what i mean but the mm-hmm. editing is really keeping things um 
uh, keeping you engaged and everything and moving. Yeah. Forth. There's a lot of locations in that scene, you know, definitely. And also like hiding the, the shoestring budget too, you know, with clever editing and like sure. making, you yes. know, like they, like, it's not that many, it's not like 10 extras or something that they doubled up and, yeah. and they, they like, they shot so many different angles and different moments and stuff. It just, if it, it feels, you know, they, they went there and shot test footage at the drive-in, yeah you know, and they mixed in that test footage with like the mm. movie, like the actual footage from the movie. Right. So like they just pulled every trick in the book to like extend it and make it a full real, I mean, that drive-in feels totally real. Like, you know, yeah. every aspect of it. And, yeah. Um, yeah. 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 Well, I had heard that the, you know, we were saying that Bogdanovich, really you know worship the altar of like hawks ford Hitchcock, <laughs> and like one of Wells. those guys i can't right right and one of those guys i can't remember gave him advice on targets he's like uh how do you think i should handle this i got no money and he's sam like fuller don't I spend think. it wasn't it yes yeah yeah so sam fuller said don't spend a dime until the last act and put all your money in the end you yeah know? great Love it. Yeah. And yeah, I heard and, Sam Fuller did like a rewrite of the script uncredited for it. Oh, for yeah, film. there's that. Yeah, there's that. Damn, too. Wow, yeah, okay. there is that. That's true. So he came up with a ton of like the killer ideas, you know. Oh, that's wow. cool. Yeah, Sam Fuller, man. And so this culminates in this, you know, the police showing up. And then, of course, Boris Karloff gets out of the car and he starts to see where the sniper is. And now we're starting to see these two stories converge. And, well, you see Boris on screen. I know. You see him in reality. Yeah. The killer sees him in reality and on screen. Love it. And is literally looking back and forth. And I thought that was just, that's like Skillamowski level mm -hmm. visual, yeah. you know, like internal, mo like, like psychological metaphors kind of like, like yeah. to, to make this, to make this strange, abstract, uh, un unbelievable, uncanny circumstance yeah. happening mm -hmm. and, and having it be a very evocative, like I'm looking at you on screen and I'm looking at you in reality and I'm being confronted and, uh, mm -hmm. And, he, and it's done really brilliantly. More great yeah. editing. That was one of the that was one of the ideas attributed to Sam Fuller was wow. that they were like trying to come up with like what to do at the end. And I Jeez. guess like maybe Karloff actually got killed in one version of it, you know. Oh. And then they, when they rewrote, you know, when they were rewriting it, he was like, um, so in the terror, is there ever Sam Fuller's asking Peter like, is there ever a shot where he's wearing a tuxedo in the terror? And he's like, yeah, actually there is a shot in the terror where he's got a tuxedo on. <laughs> wow. like, okay. We we're going to connect these two movies Cross together and they're both going to be coming. The movie Karloff is going to be coming for the uh, the shooter and the real life Karloff is going to be coming for the shooter wow. at the same time. You know? so, so that was dope. that's a Sam Fuller idea. Brill God. Moment of brilliance there. Wow. That is amazing. Wow. So this movie's the, born of a few mothers. I was going to say all the brilliant ideas are not Peter's. Okay, not sure. All right, all right. <laughs> all right. Calm um, down, everybody. <laughs> But um, well, I, it's something I wanted to just talk about before we talk about the ending of the movie is, well, just this idea yeah. of like, OK, this is a really high concept movie, right? You know, you're, you're yeah. really taking two, a story, B story. They're not there couldn't be further from each other. Um, is there a version of this where I don't know, how do you guys feel like about the A story versus the B story? Is there a version where we just want the shooter movie or how do we feel? Um. Oh, okay. I'm just asking. I'm just curious. I was well, curious. Well, the, the concept is brilliant to me, and I think it's executed. It's executed well. Marcus said earlier, like the um, the seams to to cut them together. Yeah. You know, the, the cross cutting I think is very w well art. It could have been done worse. It's it's actually pretty graceful. Yeah. Because it could have been clumsier. Yeah. And uh, I mean, you, and you know, the B, the 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 A story, I guess, the Karloff story is great because it's got Boris Karloff right. in it. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, no, of and, course. Um, I, I can. I see wonder if it, are they? Yeah. Is it fifty fifty as far as like Probably. in the running time? There's you a think lot it's of Kar like Karloff even? in the beginning. I'll tell you that. Yeah, I think it kind of starts leveling. It's, mm -hmm. It starts a lot of Karloff in his hotel room with his assistant. Yeah, but it starts sleeping tipping in bed maybe. With Potter, Peter Dagonovich, yeah. Right. Now I know what you're saying, like, but I think that because uh, it's the the Carlos story feels kind of um, it's the most time you're spending like on a sound stage too. So there's that kind yeah. of lighting that's like a fake, consequential, almost like a '60s, yeah, uh, yeah, '60s like kind of more studio evenly lighting. lit movie kind of thing. Yeah. yeah, studio lighting. So it's got that thing going on for it. It's got Carlos, who so you could view as like kind of a crusty old actor, or whatever. So it's got that thing, but I think that it's um, I think it gets graded on a curve. Uh, because it's 68 and you know that the type of movies that it was existing, that it was existing in, in the world, you know, that it was right. living amongst those type of films. So right. the party or whatever, you know, like, so right. it's, it's graded on a, on a curve. Right. And I think that it's like, right. uh, 
Uh, yeah, because because it's on the cusp. It's the first time I'm going right. to say it the whole episode. Okay. Oh my god! Yeah. Ding 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 ding! <laughs> All right, real quick, just because I want uh, Tom you to talk about the last shot uh, of the movie, but just real quick. I mean, for me, it's like I do love that it is a restriction. You know, I mean, this movie we're fan. It, it had to be made in this way. They had this 20 minutes of this movie they had yeah. to use in some way, and they found a really creative solve for it. And so it kind of transcends like would it work in any other way? I totally understand that. Um, yeah, okay, Tom, yeah. take us home with the... Uh, well, okay, so yeah, I mean, I was I was re-watching it today. It's been years, and like I was really struck by the very final shot of the film, which is very simple. I love how this, this film, you know, I always talk about um, uh, a film, uh, when it ends, it's landing the plane, and does it do it gracefully, or is it really bumpy? And this is very graceful. So all the, all the mayhem happens. He's arrested, the killer, and he's crouching like a scared child all of a sudden. It's creepy. And then the last shot, though, nothing else. Very clean. It's like dawn. It's morning. The mayhem is receding. People are at the hospital and there are cops everywhere. Elsewhere, at the drive-in, it's empty of every single car except one car, which yeah. is the killer's car. And mm. it's this big, wide shot, like from way from the distance, like in yeah. a you know a bridge, like you know uh, across the road. And uh, and that's it. It just sits on that, and then the credits roll. And I love that because it's a visual metaphor of like. Um, I know his things were uh, anomy. No one uses this word anymore. A N O M Y, and it's just this kind of creepy. Uh, uh, you know, everyone's an anonymous stranger to each other, right. and it just feels like about isolation and like this is him uh, in a, a, a like this single figure without any kind of humanity, togetherness, community, friends, family, lovers. He's just there, and it's this perfect visual metaphor. And it reminded me actually of a lot of things that happened. That's a very seventies final shot yeah mm -hmm. like that is incredible that's not cusp that's 72 yeah that's some 1972 <laughs> shit like sure play it as it lays yeah. you know plays it play it as it lays would and have a shot like that sure you know what i mean mm -hmm. yeah um of like people just driving on a, on a freeway you know an aerial shot so anyway that's all killer stuff can i end on a complaint go uh, you know, we used to always pick a, have a bone to pick in the early days of like something we didn't like about the movie. And I wish the music was better. The music that is in the movie, the rock songs, I wish they were better. Like in hindsight, it's just cheap. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Marcus gets his wish. Um, all right, everybody. That was one fucking hour on Target from 19. It's a great film for a it lot is. of reasons. It is. Yeah, it is a really cool movie. And again, very, very unique this idea. I mean, I don't think, okay, this is maybe what I meant to say is, and I'm cheating a little bit, is that they probably never okay. would have arrived at making this movie if it weren't for the way in which it came about. It would have been the, the practical, the, uh, the problem solving, the it problem been, to solve. It would have been the sniper film. It wouldn't have been this Boris Karloff yeah. mashup with the sniper thing. Right. Well, I wish and more that's the beauty of it. operated with those constraints. I you agree. Know, it's the thing about art. The best art has constraints it has to work within. And then, yeah, yeah, I wish I wish more. I wish. Yeah, I wish there were more targets. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Sure. Now there's absolutely. targets popping up everywhere. OK, so. Um, so that was it. <laughs> that was uh, it. That was the, the one-two punch of the two big cusp years. And now we're moving forward with the next episode. Cusp! Yeah, we are. Um, okay, so let's talk about next week. Of course, next week will be episode 69. So, of course, that mm -hmm. means we're doing a film from 1969. Yeah. A little year called 1969. <laughs> yeah. Not much going on in film then or, or in culture. Yeah. <laughs> kind of slow, as, they, as someone, our friend says. Kind of slow. <laughs> yeah we're at, actually we're, not yeah right yeah. It, was, it was intense Dude, here we go we, we this is going to be tough as we're moving into 69 70 71 70, these are going to be really hard to narrow down to four movies uh for you guys to pick but i think we got a really good four here that i'm very yeah. excited about i'm down to yeah. do any one of these absolutely any day of the week and we might you know, down the road, oh, pick up uh, runner ups and whatnot. Totally. Absolutely. So how this works, if you are uh, not haven't been a part of the poll before, but how this works is if you go right now to our Instagram page at one fucking hour, click on our stories uh, right there. If you're watching this within 24 hours of this video dropping, you will be able to vote from one of the following four movies that we're going to talk about here in just a second. And then whatever wins the poll uh, will be the film that we cover next week. And you only have 24 hours to participate in the poll. So it only lasts uh, for a day. And then whatever, whenever it's up, it's up. And that's the winner. 
So, all right, let's get into these. These are the four films from 1969 that uh, we have picked. And don't forget, vote, because Targets won only by a single vote, and it was very close. And there was over 100 votes, but Targets won right. <clears throat> by one. Yeah. So you got to get a, you got to get your votes wow. in. All right, let's talk about this one. It's a monster from 1969. It's a big one. It's a big 1969 film. Uh, Midnight Cowboy. Jeez. What might we expect from a Midnight Cowboy? Uh, one oh, fucking hour? I mean, uh, well, again, just to beat this to death, it's like the cusp is over, and this is a full-on 60s, late 60s film. Um, it won Best Picture. Yep. And it was X-rated which right. is insane. Yep. And like people like John Wayne, I think John Wayne presented the Oscar for best picture. And he was like, what the fuck kind of shit is this? <laughs> like backstage, like yeah. what, you know, cause he, cause he is old Hollywood, you know, personified John Wayne. And he's like, what the fuck? Who's this little weird man, Dustin Hoffman? Yeah. How dare he be, you know, cause it's about a cowboy. Right. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, so it was X rated. It's brilliant. Crazy editing. Lots of wild, progressive style filmmaking. Great it party gets scene. Verite, it gets uh, fanciful. It has a European film influence. John oh, Schlesinger. Yeah. It's emotionally impactful. Two incredible performances. New York City has never been portrayed more vividly. Yeah, mm. you know. Yeah. Uh, it's been yeah. a cowboy. In contrast to Targets, it's got great music. I was going to say, too, and <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. and and then our we get to discuss how our friend. Pablo Ferro fits into that film. Too. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So True enough. might it be one fucking hour on Midnight Cowboy or might it be the other giant, huge seismic bum, film bum, bum. from 1969? Easy Rider. Tom. Oh, Jesus Christ. What? what well, there a, you go. Again, one fucking hour on Easy Rider well, look like. One fucking hour on Easy Rider. This film was absolutely huge. I think more than we really... because. You know, more than we realize, like, you know, it's very camp now. You know, it's like, get your motor run and, you know, and all that <laughs> stuff. But this film was really popular because there were all these films that were trying to address the youth audience yeah. and they kept failing. Ding, wrong, wrong, wrong. And this one rang like a bell and yeah. everybody saw it, wanted to see it, uh, who was, you know, under 30, saw it, wanted to see it, saw it multiple times. It played for years and years yep. and years and years and years, the first run. And, uh, you know, it did so many groundbreaking things. First of all, it's Dennis Hopper, who's a certified psychopath. He directed a movie. <laughs> and that won an Oscar, too. Yeah. And they went to the Oscars. And they're a dirtbag on acid, long this hair. Is, I mean, it's oh, the cusp is over. This you know? is hell-raising <laughs> dirtbags go to the Oscars. Yeah. It's there is insane. an Oscar-winning movie uh, in 1969 that had 16-millimeter footage of people literally, truly on acid, like yeah. screaming for their parents and, like, like crying. That's <laughs> happening. Karen Black's going like, I can't get out. And she's like, you're just standing there, you know, and that's a movie, you know, also um, great music again oh, yeah. in uh, uh, this is the beginning uh, for better, or for worse of like music supervision, you know, kingdom, you know, yeah. like this is it. This is like it. films weren't like this before where it was collections of crazy songs. And, you know, so, the, you know, a lot of innovation going on here and a great depiction of, uh, you know, a snapshot of the time. Also star making Jack Nicholson was nobody. And then he was a superstar. There you go. In like his 10 minutes on film. And isn't it just just from a personal side, isn't it fair to say that Easy Rider ranks v like top for you? Isn't it? Isn't it a top, Tom? I don't know about that. I've seen it a lot. And it's just, <laughs> um, it's it's just, it's so saturated, the knowledge of it and the, and the minutia of it that I almost can't appreciate it. Like if it was a flop and no one saw it, and like it was this thing it's like an old vhs tape i'd be like whoa this is yeah. great but it's <laughs> no, just so easy writer it's like yeah. okay. okay but um still it's very enjoyable and it, it really it really lights up when you see um uh jack jack nicholson and shreds we, the humor but also his insightful right. stoner conversation at the the fire campfire yeah um it's also a huge bummer like totally. like hippie death machine the at the end, end you know like well we should yeah. you know we'll, it's cool we should also mention obviously if you're a listener of the show you know the show you know we're, we, we we i i got some feedback uh last week where people were like uh, when night of the living dead was on the poll they were sort of like don't do night of the living dead you know or whatever it's been talked about so much we're obviously going to be covering these movies you know not like it's we're you know the guys from the afi top 100 movie list we're going to be right, covering right, our right. own way with our own perspectives that's this ain't your you mom's yeah. film podcast. Yeah, yeah. So because Easy Rider <laughs> is like so cool. ubiquitous, 
You know, it is it is ubiquitous, but we're obviously going to be getting into something I know. like Easy Rider. And it's, Look, in a, in a anything can have a fresh take. Right. There you go. You know, and we're there trying you. to have fresher takes. There you I go. mean, uh, you know, we, we, we have done Star Wars and we're we doing it now. We did a commentary and, uh, you know, We Star started, Wars. you know, look, we started, the first podcast was Deliverance. Yeah. Which is not talk to death, but it's like, yeah. it's pretty well known. It's yeah. not like, we're not deep cut guys with yeah. a deep cut take. It's just like, yeah, let's just, um, let's just look at one film at a time for an hour yeah. and just, uh, you know, mull over it and, and, and treat it, fa go face to face with it. Like, like, and not yeah. necessarily be covered in cultural baggage. There you go. And, and like, maybe we have some problems with it. Maybe we like something more than, yeah, I think the big thing and I'll shut up is just, I think often what we're doing unintentionally is emphasizing things that have been underappreciated. There you go. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. I agree. Like with yeah. deliverance, we weren't really getting that much into the into the big R scene, you know, right. mm -hmm. the assault scene. And yeah. we're really getting to the second half, just as an yeah, example. Of course. So, so um, one fucking hour and easy rider it could be. Option number three, though, uh, is pretty exciting. One we've talked about and I know a lot in the past uh doing for the show. That would be one fucking hour on Putney Swope. <laughs> Well, I mean, forget it. You know, <laughs> an hour's not even, I know an hour is not enough for that one. Yeah, it yeah. might be tough. Yeah, I know. But, yeah, I mean, I've, I, yeah. I actually I befriended Robert Downey, uh, you know, senior. a few years ago. Yeah, you know, senior, and um, you know, of course he's cool as hell, and just uh, I love this film. It's crazy, and again, it was a real big hit. But what an insane film to be a hit, like on paper, just like. Like when I first saw it as a kid, I was just like, "Wait, what the hell is this movie?" <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. like because I've I to this I've never seen anything quite like it. You know, I agree. Uh, yeah. There's only one kind of film that that guy made. I mean, he, it was singular. You know. Yeah, it's incredible, and we're definitely going to get into that if we pick it. Putney Swope, uh, of course, directed by Robert Downey Sr. I mean, absolutely one of a kind it game shreds. changer <laughs> film in many ways. Yeah. There. Yeah. Um, and I guess th this might be the underdog uh, for the poll here, number four. But man, um, this would be great, and it is a um, it it would be the second film of this director that we've covered on the channel. That would be potentially one fucking hour on Frank Perry's Last Summer, and um, yeah. this is a really really underrated gem uh, um, of a movie. Totally nineteen sixty nine too. We're getting into another territory here with this movie stars barbara hershey um it's 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 a very uh, incredible lyrical sort of coming of age movie that's set on fire island where you know it kind of examines this weird love triangle dreamy love triangle yeah well it's a triangle and then there's a there's a kind of a complicating uh, second woman who comes in and right. uh, creates all kinds of chaos very rewarding film yeah uh, definitely a deep cut this is a deep cut and um it's you know i mentioned um uh, Frank and Eleanor Perry's uh, played as it lays earlier right. <laughs> in this podcast. And yeah, this is those guys too. A few years before, and um, yeah, this is uh, this is a very special film. Uh, I think it has a real uh, punch in the gut even today, uh, and it deals with a lot of like really twisted yeah. uh, human uh, emotion and social interaction. It's 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 kind of an ugly film. It is, yeah. You know what I mean? Like like there's a lot of ugly emotions, and it's unresolved by the end. It doesn't have a happy ending, and no. at all no, no no and uh but it's a deep film and it's very much of its time in in the sense that a film like this could get made like even the soundtrack was released yeah uh, you know yeah, like it's weird like uh, yeah. for a film like this yeah, yeah. and yeah uh, you know shout out to in, in the archives we did one fucking hour on the swimmer uh which was um, um a bit earlier than this movie but definitely forecasting it and that's kind of a cuspy film too in in a way <laughs> Um, it is yeah, yeah it really is and uh so yeah frank perry i think is ripe for the show He's great and, and getting into this and getting into and it is film. kind of another movie couple uh it is, I, yeah. I think that i think that frank, frank was getting the lion's share of attention at the time yeah but his wife and partner eleanor perry was very much creatively involved in the, the in screenwriter i believe too. for these movies i believe yes but then also there was more bleeding in cons consultation right. You know, on set and stuff like that. You know, right. a little similar to Peter and uh, Polly. You know, and, and for some, you know, just a coincidence. Kind so of. we'll get into. But yeah, that. very rewarding film, and I'd love to revisit any of these if they lose. That's the thing. <laughs> that would be yeah. so ugly if we went like, look, the other three we're never going to touch. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like this yeah, is yeah. serious voting, guys. Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> like, like yeah. these films are obviously in our interest, and we'll probably get right. around to one or yeah. two of the others. 
Absolutely. So. Absolutely. So what's okay. next week? It's That's, in y'all's hands. It's all in all y'all's hands. Go to the uh, the our Instagram um, account right now at one fucking hour on Instagram. Click on the stories. Vote right now, either for Midnight Cowboy, Easy Rider, Putney Swope, or Last Summer. Hell of a lineup. Um, and uh, of course, just before we uh, get to the end of the show here, make sure also check out Patreon.com slash one fucking hour sign up for five bucks a month that's the only place you're going to get our feature length audio commentary tracks we've done texas chainsaw massacre and now star wars from 1977 uh and we're going to be doing a bunch of other stuff we're probably going to do some freaky stuff from the 90s and the 2000s you know who knows we're probably going to get pretty yeah. freaky as that goes on yeah we'll mix it up and uh yeah you know there'll be what we call these love fests like tonight was a love fest you know like yeah. we either often do like love fests or uh yeah. punch in the stomach fests like hate yeah. fests so um, we haven't done that yet we will so so there probably will be a full commentary on uh on one of those fugly movies that yeah. uh we love to hate so yeah we'll do that like psycho 98 <laughs> I'm, th- I'm kind of feeling psycho 98 at some point i know we should do a i hear you but hear you. um yeah that's the only place you can get it five bucks a month sign up for the patreon uh, we've had a number of you do that so far thank you so much for that and we have instructions of course how to sync our audio with the movie it's all easy don't worry it works perfectly and uh yeah guys but i think uh before we let everybody go we cannot leave you without your moment of zen (laughs) (laughs) all right should be an interesting one but uh, thank you everybody and we'll see you next week the choice is yours vote now and we will see you on the other side of next week all right hands tell us what you want to see guys let's see it okay all right everybody take care bye-bye Young girls are not accountable for their behavior. I think Toodle Oo was the action of a ditzy young girl. And I regressed into the girl thing to escape responsibility for abandoning a patient. He asked me for help. Look, I need you as a colleague to tell me that I did the right thing. You've got to ask yourself why you became a psychiatrist in the first place. If it was only to help people to stop smoking or biting their nails, then so be it. And nothing wrong with that. Yes! Motherfucking goddamn orange peel beef. <laughs>